You're listening to the Technology for Mindfulness podcast, Episode 7, hosted by me, Robert Plotkin. Today I'm going to be speaking with Mark Barrowlane, a professor of English at Emory College and the author of numerous publications, including the topic of today's podcast, his 2009 book, entitled The Dumbest Generation, How the Digital Age Stupefies Young Americans and Jeopardizes Our Future. We're extremely pleased to welcome Professor Mark Barrowlane to the Technology for Mindfulness podcast. Hi, Mark, and welcome to the Technology for Mindfulness podcast. Well, thank you for having me. I'd like to focus mostly today on the book that you wrote, published back in 2009, that had a very bold and uh, what I'm sure was a very controversial title at the time, The Dumbest Generation, How the Digital Age Stupefies Young Americans and Jeopardizes Our Future. Now, you've been a college professor at Emory for a long time. I'm guessing that at least part of the initial motivation for this came from your observations of young people and their relation to technology. Uh, Maybe you could talk a little bit about what motivated you to write the book and what you found while you were writing it. Sure, Robert. Now, now let's not forget the sub subtitle of that book, which was, or don't trust anyone under 30. Uh, now, now uh, a USA Today reporter interviewed me about the book, and she must have been all of 25 years old. And she said, do you really think you can't trust anyone under 30? I said, it's a joke. There was this slogan back in the 60s, don't trust anyone over 30. That's all. That's all. Uh, of course you can. Of course you can. Now, uh, why I wrote the book. You know, you you see things when you uh, teach college students, especially a lot of freshman students whom I teach. So they aren't all English students. I'm an English professor. They're across the campus. Emory, where I teach, is a pretty selective institution. But even so, I observed over the years from the time I started teaching there in 89 to, you know, 2005, 2008, that the particular trait that you often found in English majors, and that is bookishness, was declining. Every semester back in uh, the 90s or in the 80s when I was teaching at UCLA, you'd have three or four or five bookish kids who really weren't so oriented toward the achievement model. They were kids who loved to read. They loved novels. They loved ideas and books that contained ideas. If you referred to a book off the syllabus, you would find when they would talk to you two weeks later that they went and looked at that book, uh, even though it wasn't part of the requirement. It was just part of their life. They had a reading life, and that's why they were that's why they were in class. You could tell every night they'd go to bed and they would they would read a book that. They hadn't been assigned by anyone else. It was just something that they did. Well, as we all know, the the digital age uh, came upon us and it hit young people hard in the 90s and the aughts, especially when social media, texting and all the rest uh, took off in, in the mid aughts there. And I simply found that more and more kids, even in English, weren't real literary types. They would not go up in the library and sit in the carol or in the chairs and read all afternoon. They were more and more attached to those screens. And if you go into libraries today, you see a lot more kids at computer terminals than you see them in the stacks or sitting in a chair reading an actual book. And when I would go on the quad, Uh, between classes. You know what it looks like. All the kids are walking there. They've been out of the network for an hour, hour and a half. They're walking across from building to building, and they got their eyes attached to that doggone little screen to see what has been happening in between uh, the the morning hours and and the lunch hour. And I could just see the peer pressure streaming across their faces. And I thought this is a this is a terrible thing, and I I, w- I actually would not want to be young today. 
There's a, there's a lot to talk about here. I, one thing I just want to ask you about for people who haven't read the book is what you base the book on. I did ask you to start with your personal observation, uh, but I, I know from reading the book, the the content of the book itself is not just based on anecdotes or what you've observed personally. Maybe you can talk a little bit just to give the background for people who might have an immediate skeptical reaction that what you've observed maybe isn't really representative. Talk a little bit about the data that are behind the book. You know, I worked at the National Endowment for the Arts from 2003 to 2005. And one of the biggest surveys in the country of people's leisure arts habits is something called the Survey of Public Participation in the Arts. It's conducted by the uh, by the Census Bureau, but it's designed and and uh, distributed by the National Endowment for the Arts. And I was the head of the research uh, the research programs there, which put out this this survey. And we did it every ten years. And from 1992 to 2002, one subject really struck out to us, and that was this huge decline in 18 to 24 year olds in reading any literature or in reading any books. We asked about both. Literature we just defined as, as fiction, short stories, novels, poems, plays, anything, liter or literary essays. And it was astonishing how from 92 to 2002, we went from about 57% of them did read at least one work in the preceding year to 43% at reading at least one. And when we said at least one, one short story, one poem, did you do any reading at all? And it wasn't classics necessarily. We didn't we didn't make value judgments. If you were reading trashy romance novels <laughs> or or adventure, detective, science, any of the genres, that would be fine too. Were you doing any literary reading on your own that is not assigned for work or school? And in 10 years, we had a huge drop. And this was really the first data point that uh, I, I, I based the book on. And then when I looked further into it, such as surveys of the National Survey of Student Engagement, which is several hundred thousand students a year, asking them how much they read on their own for pleasure, those numbers had dropped. The American Freshman Survey put out by a UCLA research group uh, every year since 1966, those numbers dropped. The U.S. Department of Education keeps statistics on leisure reading that that high school students do big decline and when i kept hearing from so many technology digital enthusiasts talking about how these millennials are so smart they're so worldly they're connected they have more information and knowledge at their fingertips than ever before they're going to blow us away <laughs> when they get older uh, it was time for someone to say, oh, wait a minute, the numbers aren't showing anything here. And in the last 10 years, we see the outcomes here. SAT reading scores are at their lowest point now in more than 40 years. And this is in spite of the billions, not millions, billions of dollars that have gone into reading instruction. Uh, the SAT added a writing component in 2006, scores have dropped every year except two years when they were flat and reading, good writing is often a function of, of strong reading habits. It's so bad that the SAT has now made the writing component optional. Uh, remedial courses, enrollments in college keep going up in writing because all these kids, they get accepted to college and then they take a diagnostic test in August and they find that their writing is so poor that they're not ready for college level work. So they go into what used to be called dumbbell English, uh, where they don't get any credit for it. And it shows that you did not get the education that you needed. Many of them would have reading tests and going to reading remediation as well. Uh, if you uh, were to ask college uh, professors, if you, if you were to ask employers now about the communication skills of young people, uh, broadly speaking, the verbal skills, which begin with reading, uh, you, you, you would have to pr go pretty far before you found someone to say, boy, these young people, they're such better readers and speakers than they used to be. 
it's uh, I, I think the numbers are, are are very clear now that we do have a uh, uh, a language a language issue a verbal skills issue which does get get back down to reading and I actually blame screens as the main uh, the main culprit of this. Uh, uh, what people don't realize is young people are, in, in some ways, they're reading and writing more words than ever before in human history. And I mean with all the texting and the chatting and the instant messaging, the notes, the commenting. Uh, I mean, they're down up to about 3,500 text messages a month. Uh, this was a couple of years ago. And the problem here is that writing is not transferable. By what I mean by that is that if you write 3,000 text messages a month, you don't become a better writer. You become a better writer of text messages. Well, and, and I remember, as you said, back in the ancient days of the internet, back in the mid-late 90s, there were a lot of pundits out there uh, who were proclaiming that this increase in writing and reading of text, I remember people saying, uh, young people are engaging with text more than ever before. They're reading more than ever before. They're writing more than ever before. And they were predicting very confidently that this would result in young people becoming better writers, better readers, more creative, on and on and on. We had the terms digital native, digital mm -hmm. generation, etc. And in fact, people, I remember, went so far as to claim that um, their... Uh, the, uh, the adults around them should be looking to the young people to learn from. Oh, Robert, Robert. I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a teacher, but I really learn more from my students than they learn from me. I should be paying them. They shouldn't be paying me to do my job. <laughs> I hear that. <laughs> this is the <laughs> yes. kind of stuff yes. that, you, that you often hear. And my, my feeling about that is if you learn more from your students than they learn from you, then you shouldn't be at the podium. <laughs> uh, you're you're uh, you're not a good teacher, but this is where you run up against an attitude, uh, an attitude that has nothing to do with the data. It's very deep seated. You, know, you I don't know if you'd call it ideological or psychological, political, something. But many many people in the education world, one, they don't want to seem out of touch. They don't want to seem old fashioned and behind the times. They want to be aware of what's going on in the present. They are very progressive in, in that sense. And the very worst thing that you could say about them is a, they're curmudgeon, old crap, <laughs> get off my lawn types. And so they don't want to criticize their students. They want to you know, show how much they really care about the kids. And sometimes they show up uh, after you know, they're 50 years old and, and you know, they show up with a, a, one day with a ponytail and an earring. Uh, on college campuses, never saw that before, but suddenly uh, uh, they're 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 hip to uh, the new. Now, uh, along with this uh, desire for contemporaneity, is a an acceptance, right? The tolerance for people's personal habits. You just don't criticize young people for what they do on their own time. You don't tell them, as I say to my students, for instance, uh, when they're freshmen, I say, you guys, if you, you like certain music, you're just out of high school and you have certain musical tastes. If you're ta if you like the same thing now, the, uh, if you like the same thing in four years when you graduate that you like now, you will have failed. Taste is something to develop to cultivate the taste of an adolescent should not be the taste of a 25 year old taste is something that can be grown up or it can be juvenile now this is something they do not hear from any of their other teachers and i think it is an abdication of our responsibility as teachers to in, in the humanities to show them that there is something so much better than the youth culture stuff that they are immersed in all the time. And if they're not shown it by someone else, they won't. They won't develop 
I mean, taste is something that grows by exposure, by familiarity. And if I don't tell them that the, uh, the, 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 the prelude of Wagner's Lohengrin is a great thing, and it is so much better, and I have no hesitation in saying that some cultural artifacts are better than others, it is so much better than that pop, rap, whatever junk you listen to, uh, and that you should try it. Then we aren't we aren't upholding the the things that we've been trained in. Isn't this one of the big challenges for our age that we're we're in a culture that values novelty uh, and innovation? In my day job, I'm a patent lawyer. My job is to uh, recognize novelty, technological innovation, and as a culture, we generally value it. And then one question that we have to face is, where is the place then for tradition or knowledge that people have acquired over the ages that is old and not novel? Right. And, and I think we have several models for how that is done. One is the, the modernists, 100 years ago. What was the most innovative experimental poem of the time? It was T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland. But if you read The Wasteland, it is packed with tradition. You have an epigraph from Dante and another one from, let's see, is it Petronius? Um, uh, uh, the Sybil, it's, it's uh, the Sybil who says she wants to die. The first, the first lines have the opening, you have a block quotation from the libretto of Wagner's Tristan. Uh, it is filled with ancient myth, Elizabethan tragedy, and, uh, and biblical references. And yet Eliot took all those traditional materials and he formed them into something extraordinarily innovative and new. James Joyce's Ulysses, you know, the great modernist novel. The skeleton comes from Homer, the Odyssey. There you have uh, a, an explanation for how uh, new innovation does not necessarily mean we ignore or neglect the past. And the modernists, including Ezra Pound, would say that in renouncing the past, in saying we know so much more than they did before, we have such better attitudes than they did before, this is a formula for your own datedness. In other words, if, 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 you're, if you're writing only with the present in mind, in 20 years, they're going to look back on what you produced and it's going to seem so dated. Uh, one of the problems with this generation of millennials is that so many of them feel because they're not immersed in old books and, and art, they feel that they really are the first generation in, in human history to get it right. They are the most open, tolerant, progressive, anti-racist, anti-sexist, anti-homophobic, and so on generation that ever lived. And they look upon their elders with a degree of contempt. Uh, you guys did so many bad things. And we are, uh, our, our virtue towers above of yours. Well, they're going to get their comeuppance when the next generation comes along and grows up. Because the millennials only look upward and judge. If they look downward when they're in their 30s and 40s and they look up at teenagers and 20-year-olds and they judge them, those teenagers and 20-year-olds are going to disdain them. They're not interested in the scolding of the, the, their, their, immediate, uh, their immediate elders. And the, the, this, 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 this is a welcome comeuppance, I think, precisely because... The millennials have a bad anti-past, anti-tradition attitude. It's very interesting. Uh, 
um, I think back to, let's say, the 1960s here, it was a very significant clash between the generations, no doubt about it, no holds barred. And yet even the pop music and poetry and other young culture of the time often made references back to classical literature, to Greek mythology, to the Bible, to older traditions. Uh, and, and I think what we will find is the culture that survives from those years is the culture that was in a creative and critical engagement with the past. I mean, Bob Dylan is very much in a folk tradition. Uh, he gave it his, his rock spin on, on that, but he had his precursors and he acknowledged them. You know, when you, when you listen to some of the rock music, like the Allman Brothers, mm -hmm. what is the Allman Brothers that, that to me, uh, remains fresh is the stuff that came out of the blues, right? And they were listening to old blues players from, from the 30s and 40s and 50s. That was that that that's the stuff that uh, that, that that survives. Uh, I I would say. Um, now, uh, this is primed for this attitude toward the past. I mean, a positive, critical attitude toward the past thrives if people grow up again, reading books being exposed to old things outside their own peer group. And one of the things that the social media does is it reinforces the peer-to-peer -peer contact like never before. They are constantly in touch with one another, 17-year-olds with 17-year-olds. And, and it's an aggravation of a process that really began 40 or 50 years ago called age segregation. Age segregation is when people only relate to people of their own age. And they can do that now with tools. They, they couldn't do that always before. You went home uh, at the end of the day and you had dinner with your parents. There was maybe one TV uh, in the room. They watched the news, Walter Cronkite. And you didn't really have any contact with anyone. I mean, there was one landline, as it's now called, uh, in the house. Some people would talk on the phone. Oh, you could talk to one person for a while, but it was it wasn't uh, uh, something you would spend all night doing. You were in a different world than 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 your social world. You thought about it. You thought about girls and what's going on in high school and so on, but you didn't uh, feel the pressure. You didn't feel like something's happening now. You know, some 80, 85 percent of teenagers with a cell phone sleep with it on right next to their pillow, right there at their at their nightstand. They get they get pictures all night, messages, news about what's going on with their friends. And it just never stops. It sounds like you're talking about a couple of things. And one is the. The la if I'm understanding you correctly, the lack of cross-generational contact that, that we know kids have always um, uh, spent time with other kids during school, after school. It sounds like you're talking about this swinging almost entirely in one direction, though, where all of the contact by young people is with other young people and not with people in older generations. And as a result, they're, they're not getting the kind of cultural transfer from the previous generations that they used to. Is that right? I think that's a, that's a good way of putting it. Uh, the, the, the intergenerational cultural transfer, uh, because again, this is how they grow up. If you just relate to your own age group, 17 year olds don't teach other senior 17 year olds how to grow up somewhere. It has to come from an older figure, mother, father, older brother, aunt, uncle, priest, teacher, Someone who can show them how to how to act like a man and a woman. Uh, the youth can't do it for themselves, but many many of them are growing up now, only learning about adulthood from one another. Which is why I believe we we have a massive juvenilization of American mass culture. Today, I mean, I, I can't even watch TV because I can't I can't observe in commercials and TV shows 
uh, grown men behaving like clowns, like 15 year old boys and thinking they're cute or, or, or taking, taking pride in their silliness. I, I can't, <laughs> I've got a 12 year old son. And so I spend a lot of time uh, showing him old movies like The Great Escape and The Magnificent Seven <laughs> and, and uh, films that at least showed uh, grown men who didn't always talk, 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 talk all the time. They weren't sarcastic. They weren't trying to be, uh, trying to pop off ironic witticisms every other minute. If you watch a film like The Great Escape, if you know this film, some of those characters like Charles Bronson, they hardly said a word. They're alert, they're attentive, but they only talked when they had something substantive to say. And they would never get into these bickering things that you see on ESPN, for instance, all the time. I can't watch ESPN Sports Center, for instance, because to me it's just the view for for middle-aged men, um, or the way they show uh, athletes behaving on the field. Can you imagine uh, uh, Jim Brown or or Bart Starr trash talking and boasting and swaggering? around the field the way these these guys do today sportsmanship you know respecting your opponent being a good loser and a good winner these are uh, these are virtues that ESPN they don't put on camera very much they like the flamboyance they like, you watch the highlights in ESPN half of it i would swear is the celebrating in the end zone, the dancing, the chest thumping, or guys getting into a fight or uh, things like this. This is what counts, is it counts more than the game. I've gone, I can't go to NBA basketball games anymore because I can't stand the music blasting even during the game. It's becoming such, again, a juvenile entertainment. Um, and and I, I think all these things are reinforced by social media where people can go back and forth. They can comment anonymously, say things that are insulting or, or snide with no accountability. And I say to my son, Jack, Jack, never say things online that you wouldn't say to someone's face. Okay. And if you wouldn't say it to someone's face for whatever reason, including if you're scared of that person, then you shouldn't say it online either. Uh, that's that's the lesson. But certainly that's that's not what it's uh, uh, not what the the online environment promotes. You know, one thing that that I hear in what you're saying uh, across a few different topics sounds to me like a movement towards constant seeking of short-term excitement. Uh, things like you said, the celebration, the fights, things oh, the that are... The stimulation has to be constant. Right. Right. Yes. And, and I, I, uh, I, I took my son to, uh, to a kind of sea world place, a small one. And, uh, outdoors, showing the seals and walruses doing their tricks, but the music was blasting so loud I had to put my hands over my ears. And I I've been in children's museums before where I've had to ask the staff, can you please turn the music down? And not only that, but they were, you know, for five-year-olds, they're playing things like the Talking Heads and David Bowie and <laughs> music, music that we thought was for 18-year-olds. For uh, uh, but this hyper overstimulation in movies, you see this too. Uh, the, the, the special effects, the dazzle, the quick cuts, uh, it, it's, it, it complements actually the dumbed down conversation. 
I don't know if you remember the old Batman TV show from the 60s. Sure. The diction in that show was extraordinary, as was the the pronunciation by all the actors. You didn't hear anyone say like, 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 like. There was no (laughs) valley girl talk in uh, in that show, but you you did get, uh, or, or I don't know if you remember, I, I was watching that show Kung Fu. Sure. Uh, a clip on that a while ago where the master is teaching the young Kane about chi, uh, as in Tai Chi, what chi is. And there were lines like, the venality that's, uh, that lays in the heart of every man. How often do you hear the word venality? on primetime TV <laughs> these days. Uh, so I think mass culture 40, 50 years ago still had a lot of a lot of traces of, let's say, grown-up culture. Uh, high culture would, would find its way in. Uh, I mean, Johnny Carson, the old Tonight Show, he used to spend almost every show the last 10 minutes was with an author. A guy had a book come out. And Johnny Carson has the author to talk about the book. I don't think David Letterman had too many authors uh, on on his show. The closest thing I saw was Stephen Colbert when he would have his author come on, but that was really just to yuck it up uh, on on uh, on some different ideas. Um, I'd like to bring it back a little bit to what we talked about in the beginning. I'd play a little bit of devil's advocate, uh, mm-hmm. which is, um, to say, ask again, how is, doesn't every generation think the generations that follow it aren't as smart, as hardworking, and on and on and on? Uh, in, in what way do you think what you, you're witnessing now uh, is different in some way? And I know the book, you were very careful to limit this just to intellectual development. You know, it's, it's interesting. People will often respond to these kinds of criticisms of the young with, oh, they've been complaining about the young ever since Socrates. Uh, you know, they, they, they said the same thing about comic books and Elvis Presley uh, as well. Give it a rest, will you? <laughs> and I say, but wait a minute. You guys are the ones who have said that the digital age constitutes a genuine revolution that there has been nothing like the digital age in 600 years, 500 years, ever since the, the, the printing press, movable type. So uh, now you're arguing that kids are no different today? Wait a minute. You're the ones who say that people are thinking differently now, really deep down to the level of how we process words and thoughts has changed. So I'm just taking my argument about how this constituting a genuine break from you. The second thing I will say is uh, when you get older, you have a responsibility to the young. And your responsibility is to tell the young that they're young and stupid (laughs) and, and arrogant and that this is part of your responsibility as an elder. It's something that helps the young grow up. Now, the young's responsibility is to talk back to you and to say, wait a minute, there's all these things going on that you're not aware of, and you're way too grooved, and you're too inflexible. This is a good thing to have that argument between the generations. For there to be some tension between old and young is the sign of a healthy society. This is the way young people actually grow up. It's part of the process. The teacher who smiles and tries to be buddies with the students, even though he's 55 years old, and who is just accepting of all the puerile stuff the kids bring into class, he's not doing his job He's not doing those kids any favors. They may feel good in his class, but a year later, they're going to realize, you know, I could have gotten a lot further in that class if that teacher were a little hard on me in in certain ways. Now, 
you be hard on them, but you've got to be attentive to it. You don't just say, kids are a bunch of dorks, get off my lawn. No, you say, well, you guys, come on, smarten up. Let me recommend some books to you. I mean, you engage with them. And, and I, I get a lot of, I still get emails from young people. Some of them are angry. I respond to every single one. If I didn't respond, then it would show all I want to do is complain and I don't care. But I do care about the minds of the young. That's what's important. I don't care about what went on over the weekend. I don't care about them and their friends. I don't care about their dumb Facebook page. They all look alike. I do care about the development of their tastes, their knowledge, their sensibility. And the, the responsibility on my part is to make it better. It reminds me of the uh, philosophy I've experienced in, in learning martial arts. Um, you know, the, the teacher is there to show you the path they've taken before. Um, the criticism is often harsh, and there's an expectation that the student will be rigorous and um, eventually master the old ways of doing things. And in most schools, it's once you've mastered the old way that you're understood to have some freedom to innovate and perhaps build on and take take the tradition to the next generation in a way that you might personalize some way, but only after you've mastered what came before. And the relationship between the teacher and student is very much like what you said, certainly not friends or buddies, but respectful. You know, one of the first lessons of martial arts is humility. Yes. Right? You, you, can't, you can't do uh, Wing Chun or any of the other martial arts if you don't begin with humility. One, because there's always someone better than you. <laughs> who, can, who, who could who could who could put you down? Uh, two, because you are out to master, in part, your own ego. I mean, ego in martial arts is is your enemy. It's de it could be death. <laughs> it could be death. It could lead you to bad decisions. The more ego you have, the less aware you are of what's going on around you. You need to stay relaxed, right? You, yes. you need to keep your focus and you don't, you don't engage with the world on ego versus ego terms. And if you've done a lot of martial arts, you've probably seen what happens when, when you've got a braggart and a bully and a boaster who comes up against a martial arts person who doesn't have that kind of ego. And I've seen this where the, the bully kind of is at a loss mm -hmm. because the martial arts guy isn't, isn't reacting with the same kind of ego, nor is the martial arts guy showing the fear. Right. And that, that kind of neutral relaxation doesn't give that bully any material to work with. <laughs> so that's why you'll often find the bully will only amplify. Right. Raise his voice even more because he's not getting something to work with. And I think the humility, humility is a very powerful, it's actually, that's the paradox of, of it, right? It's a very powerful, uh, uh, I'm not even going to call it a weapon. It's not, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a powerful force in human relations. Now, we both know, is there anything more anti-humility than the internet, than social <laughs> media? It's all uh, Facebook, you know, your space, it's your page, YouTube. Remember the... Uh, the motto of YouTube, the original motto, it was up in the corner of the, of the YouTube page, broadcast yourself, yourself. You know, Instagram, I'm even going to take pictures of the food I'm going to eat in a few minutes. That's how important I am. 
Um, so I think the, the, the I, I, I'm a very big fan of, of martial arts training for, for the reasons, for the ego humility reasons, as much as for the, the self-defense reasons. Yeah. And there is a, in, in some schools, the ones I've had the privilege of being in, there is a, there is a certain transfer of knowledge that goes from old to young. And I, I've witnessed some of the things you mentioned too, you know, the young people coming in, being almost following the storyline of uh, old stories you hear, the young, boastful, brash young person, and, and most of the time learning humility, uh, but that is that is what young people do, uh, and they do need they do need skilled um, elders to to teach them. I wonder, you know, if we can we've been talking a lot about the problem. We have talked about technology; it's come into almost everything we've said. I, I wonder what your if you have any prescriptions are for helping to turn us back in the right direction and as this podcast is about technology and mindfulness to what what role do you think technology might actually play in helping if any well robert there's fantastic stuff out there on youtube for instance i mean i i, I my, my son my son and i frequently uh, watch these old movies on YouTube. They're great documentaries, old TV shows, old interviews. The technology contains fantastic material, including great music. And so what you do is you, you grab your kids and you, you steer them toward that technology, those materials for certain times during the day. Um, you tell your children, you talk to your children about, about different things uh, in, in your life, how different things were when you were young. You, you talk to them about what's going on in their lives. And what you're doing is you're giving them a little adult sounding boards for what's happening in their social worlds and at school. So the, the, the broad principle is give them a taste of adult conceptions, of adult evaluation, of adult concerns. So when I'm with my son and we're down in the subway and there is some idiotic poster for some new silly movie, that shows these actors and actresses all lined up and they're all posing and they, they, everything is so ridiculously stylized in, in a juvenile way. I'll just look and I'll say, hey, Jack, how many hours did they spend in front of the mirror getting it just right? So, you, you know, you don't come down hard on it. You don't play the scold. You, you kind of give a little bit of a, a, a humorous distance on on a lot of the silliness and uh then you you read you read on your own you show your child reading i mean apart from reading books with your kids when they're when they're young but mo model model the behavior you're talking you model about. it you model it yourself um i mean i mentioned old movies i want i want my son to see the, these old movies, because they were a kind of moral instruction for young men and women uh, back in those old days when you know villains were kind of there. There, there was there were good guys and bad guys. You know, this was before everything became gray, even in the young years. You know, I read my son the Hardy Boys books. Got your good guys and you got your bad guys, <laughs> <laughs> and that's it's clear. We'll let the moral ambivalence strike them when, when they're 16, 17 years old, when they have the equipment to absorb that. I wonder sometimes, uh, I I've, have watched some old movies lately, and I'm struck, and when I say old, I don't even mean necessarily dating back to the 40s or the 50s. I mean even the 70s sometimes. 
that the pace of these movies is so much slower than we have now. There are long periods of time with very little happening, particularly very little exciting happening, and the difference is just striking to me now. I have seen studies of even things like movie trailers where just the number of cuts has increased, I want to say, by 100% over the last 30 or 40 years to make it more visually interesting and to keep people's attention focused, regardless of the content. And I do wonder, uh, uh, and I, you, you, from either your studies or direct experience with your children or your students, I wonder what you can say about the, 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 attention span that's being cultivated by modern media and young people. This is another thing that is crucial for parents to instill in their children. And that is that power of concentration that and imagination that our hyperstimulation doesn't cultivate. You're right. It's so quick. The, the, the pace of images and cuts and speech is, is much faster than it was before. I actually read somewhere that the average time between a cut in, in feature films from the 50s to the present has been divided in half. So when you get a scene in a film like Vertigo, Alfred Hitchcock's 1959 film, when Jimmy Stewart has been asked by this old friend of his to follow his wife around the city, San Francisco, there is a sequence when he first starts following her. She comes out of the Mark Hopkins Hotel, gets in her car and starts driving around. She goes to different places. It's about 12 or 13 minutes, very slow (laughs) and no dialogue. He just follows her car turn. She parks in an alley. She goes into a flower shop. She then goes to a church, goes to a cemetery outside the church. Then she goes out to (laughs) uh, 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 like a bed and breakfast and checks in. Uh, Oh, she goes to the Palace of Legion of Honor as well and sits in front of a painting. And he just follows her. And it's so slow. Uh, It's ominous. Mm -hmm. But if you are impatient... If you need action, if you need noise, you can't, you can't follow this. And this is a shame because, you know, in the last silver screen poll of critics and scholars, Vertigo came up as the greatest film. Uh, they're their top film. Citizen Kane came in second for the first time uh, a few years ago. If then you, you need the stimulation then there's a whole area of artistic experience and enjoyment that you can't, you can't possess. Say I I could mention other slow sequences in great films, such as when the the people search for Anna on the Island in the Antonioni film, La Ventura, uh, where just kids would look at it and say, nothing's happening. I'm bored. Say your, your eye, and your ear and your imagination are are far are are fallow. They're they're not they're not activated to to a high degree. I'm wonder and I'm wondering what can be done in, again, in terms of thinking about uh, the future. Uh, you know what what can we do uh, to help? I know I remember uh, reading about. Uh, Art professor, I think she was at Harvard, asked her students that as an assignment to go to a museum, pick a painting, or maybe a sculpture, any piece of art, and look at it for an hour. Right. Um, and of course, that was it had some very interesting results because paying that kind of extended attention to one thing was not something they were familiar with. Uh, previous generations had a lot of experience with that 
sitting in a field or doing other things without even having to be a homework assignment where you might be focused on one thing for an hour to now become almost unheard of. So I, I, I don't know if you do anything or if you have any suggestions for teachers, parents, or even young people themselves who want to cultivate this kind of more extended attention. Well, uh, Robert, you have to talk about this. You have to talk about this with the students and with the parents, if, you, if you've got uh, primary and secondary students, you have to make them aware of what they're missing. Let them know that these enjoyments that they have in this accelerated habitat isn't good for them. They need to, they, they need to do other things. And if they don't, then they're gonna find themselves 35 years old living impoverished intellectual and aesthetic lives. They uh, need to be shown and told that there is more to life than managing your social network, that the, the, the books that they resented reading in school are actually good for them. And if they don't like them, that there's something wrong with them, there's nothing wrong with the books. And, well, let me put it this way. So I'll say to, I'll say to guys in the, in the class, you know, let's say you fall in love. You have found your dream girl. You're 21 years old. She's 20 years old. You're, 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 you're reaching the end of college. You want to be with her forever. And she wants to be with you too. And everything is going well. And then she invites you home to meet her parents. And this is, this is big. And you go sit down at the dinner table with them. You meet them. They seem, they seem nice. But her father was a big uh, Ronald Reagan fan. Her mother's a big Bill Clinton fan. <laughs> and they talk about politics and they go back to Reagan and Clinton, Republicans, Democrats, those years. And you don't know anything. <laughs> you think the Cold War was about climate or something. <laughs> what do you think her parents are going to think of you? What they're going to think is, oh, brother. My daughter can do so much better than this. <laughs> Is that what you want? Let's you guys realize you want you think you live in this wonderfully tolerant, open, diverse world. Let me tell you something, especially in these these professional zones my students want to enter. You are judged all the time. You are judged by how you speak, by how you dress, by how you act by what you know. If you go to lunch with coworkers and someone mentions something that happened and there was a lot of newspaper reportage on it and you don't even know what it is, you think, you think people don't make a silent judgment about you? If someone mentions something about Shakespeare and you make a joke about never reading Shakespeare in college, do you think that reflects well upon you? So these <laughs> these are the ways that I try to let them let them know that what may pass with your buddies when you're 20 years old isn't going to work with coworkers who are 38 or with your beloved's parents. You need to develop yourself a little more because. There still are a lot of people in this world who make those judgments. They don't say so openly, but you just say, how impressive am I as a person? Do I put a like in every sentence? And I hear a lot of 35 year old men talking like 14 year old girls, valley girls these days. I say, if you do, I tell students this, if you put a like in every sentence, no one is ever going to take you seriously. 
And it sounds like you, you're letting them know they're living in something of a bubble where they may not ever get that feedback now. And but, it will hurt them. And it will it hurt will. them. And they don't, no one tells them, this is going to hurt you. When you go, when you leave your youth world, when you get out there, it's going to hurt you if you don't know things and if you talk like a teenager. It's interesting. I do. Uh, I wanted to ask you, since the book was published in 2009, I got the sense most of the research was based on uh, studies from students a few years before that. Um, have you have you kept up with with that kind of research? Is there anything you could tell us about how things have panned out? I mean, those kids then would be what in their mid late twenties, maybe early thirties now. Yeah, yeah, I, I can, I, I do follow it, and and, and Robert, it's, it's only getting worse. Mm. Okay. Everything, <laughs> it's, 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 we we find employers are complaining ever more about the not only the poor low skills but the poor habits of recent high school and college graduates, and this is one thing that has opened up even wider when say the, the, uh, uh, the American Associations of College and Universities did a poll of employers, human resources, people and employers, and college grads. And they asked them to, recent college grads, they asked them to relate the kids on a whole series of measures. Like, how, how good are you at critical thinking, problem solving? And then they asked the employers the same questions and asked them to rate the discrepancies were extraordinary between how the millennials estimate their own abilities and how employers and human resources resources people estimate their abilities. Mm -hmm. We have this widening gap in, in reality. And part of it is because of grade inflation. I mean, when you are in college, and 45% of all the grades given in college are A's, <laughs> you believe you're the best. You're not. And when you leave there and go into the workplace and find, I don't quite have the skills that I thought I had, well, at first, you just don't believe it. You've been told for years about how great you are. And now you're in the workplace and... You know, you don't finish something, uh, whereas before you could go to your professor and say, I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time writing, but can I have a day or two extension? And the professor always says, yeah, sure. And the boss says, you don't leave here until you finish this. Well, <laughs> that's kind of a wake-up call, but it's, it's one that, that they, that they need, need badly. And it sounds like you're saying there's, there's almost a, a culture shock uh, when they leave academia out into the work world. Right. It is. It is. And the millennials are changing the workplace just because of the numbers. I mean, they they want more flexibility. They they want uh, a, a world that is more about life work balance, the kinds of things that I would never have demanded out of the workplace, out of my job when I was when I was 25 years old. They. Uh, they find a matter of, of of propriety. Of course, I should I should get this, and corporations, businesses are having to conform because this is the this is the young workforce. This is what they're dealing. With. This is this is all they've got. I mean, there there might be, and maybe you disagree. There might be some piece of this that is a legitimate part of this uh, contentious dialogue between the generations. Uh, I don't know. I, I, would, you... I would accept that. Yeah, I would accept that. I mean, I, I, I find the, uh, yeah, the American way of work is sometimes a little overdone. The European model we laugh at, but you know that that month off of August in France, you know that that uh, that can make for more pleasing, <laughs> more pleasing life for for people. But yeah, I mean, the thing I've been concerned about seeing, I, I focus uh, and tend to be more in touch with law students, is 
the fact that when you enter the work world, if it's in, in law practice or not, but in, uh, the, there's an extent to which the competition will make the decisions for you. And you, I need to cater to clients and I am not going to do that at all costs. But, um, if, if I, or if, let's say these students don't understand what's really necessary to perform, uh, and satisfy the needs of clients, uh, that's just going to have an impact on them, uh, whether they like it or not, or think it's fair or not. And, uh, at the very least, we owe it to them to let them know what the reality is that they're going to face without saying it's good or bad. Uh, it just is, it is the reality that if you behave in certain ways, it will have consequences for you. I think that, uh, that that's, that's a fair, that's a fair expectation. And that's probably the strongest, the strongest argument to make, uh, about, about their future and why it is important to read, to know history, to, to cultivate their test, their, 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 their taste, uh, rather than, rather than saying, no, it's really important that, you know, Virgil, mm. uh, mm -hmm. that you read the Aeneid, all the founders, the founders thought Virgil was so important. They put him on the dollar bill, uh, the $1 bill, uh, Novus Ordo Seclorum, but that, that isn't going to fly too far. <laughs> But if, but if you tell them, you guys, don't, don't, don't you know that this is, this is part of being uh, a responsible, impressive citizen and a discerning consumer? Hmm. You're going to be a more interesting person. You're going to be someone whom others want to listen to. If you don't, you're just another guy, just another gal. Do you really, do, do, don't you envision something more for yourself? That, that, those are the arguments I've found most. That's, yeah, that's very helpful. It's very helpful. Let me ask, uh, uh, do, do you see any positive signs or trends now in, in young people? Do you, do you see any reversal of this, of the trend that you documented in the dumbest generation? Hmm. The answer may be no. <laughs> well, I, I will say that, you know, books, real books as opposed to e-books, seem to have been holding steady much more than was predicted five or six years ago. The e-book was, was climbing very quickly as a portion of overall books sold. That has slowed considerably. And, and it could be that the material reality of books, especially with kids, is insisting upon itself. And that the digitization of everything may be, may be slowing down. Uh, it, it could be that people still like not virtual reality, but real reality. Mm-hmm in certain areas. And I, I think that there's a, a, a certain, um, oh, a certain fatigue with social media, just in terms of its social aspect. I mean, Facebook now is, is often coordinated with professional ambitions, with companies who are doing marketing and advertising. It is less of a social network alone and more of a business and commerce kind of thing uh that's that's what that i think is a is a positive trend those two things great yeah so it's possible maybe it's too early to tell we might be seeing some sort of self-correction going on uh it doesn't lessen our responsibility to to help nudge things in a better direction right right um well, great. Uh, I, I really appreciate you speaking, and I just want to encourage everyone to go out and read The Dumbest Generation. Uh, it's a, it, the subject matter is quite a bit different than the things we've covered in this podcast before, which tend to have more to do directly with mindfulness practice and mindfulness generally. Uh, but I, I really was struck by this book. 
Uh, I think it has real implications for mindfulness, which is a kind of attentiveness and ability to direct one's attention uh, to the to the present moment. So I'd re- I really recommend people to read it, particularly people who might hear hear the title, hear some of the conclusions, and have an immediate skeptical reaction because it really is backed up. Uh, by a lot of data that I think, you know, people really have to take seriously uh, if they find themselves being skeptical of it. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for being here, Mark. Really appreciate it. Enjoyed it. Thanks for joining us for this Technology for Mindfulness podcast with me, Robert Plotkin, and today's guest, Mark Barrelane, the author of The Dumbest Generation, How the Digital Age Stupefies Young Americans and Jeopardizes Our Future. If you liked today's episode, please leave us a review on iTunes and share the episode with your friends. Those and all other links are in the show notes, and check out our blog at technologyformindfulness.com for information and tips about science, technology, and mindfulness. I'm Robert Plotkin, and I'll join you next time on the Technology for Mindfulness podcast.